The Sunday Baroque podcast is made possible by WSHU and the Friends of Sunday Baroque. You can find out more about the Friends of Sunday Baroque and find out how to become one yourself by visiting our website, sundaybaroque.org, under the Contact tab. Ilya Finkelstein is principal cellist of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, a position he has held since 2009. The Juilliard School graduate has also been principal cellist of the Mostly Mozart Festival Orchestra since 2004, and he augments his orchestral playing as a soloist and chamber musician. And with such a high profile and demanding career, a fine instrument is absolutely essential. And Ilya joins me via Zoom to talk about great cellos, including the ones he plays. Hi, welcome. Hi, Susan. Thank you for having me. So before we talk about cellos, though, this is a really challenging time in the world during a pandemic. So how are you doing in general with quarantining? And have you been pursuing any special hobbies? Uh, what a wonderful question. <laughs> uh, the hobbies. Let me start with the hobbies. Golf has been my hobby for the past 10 years. And so as to being by oneself, being outside far away from everybody, I think that's one of the most perfect things I could have thought of, uh, walking, you know, form of exercise, breathing, uh, fresh air most of the time. Um, it's really good for not only uh, for health reasons, but also for mental reasons, getting out of the house and uh, looking at the nature and connecting some animals around, usually geese. Actually, now you could see that they're flying away. You know, the fall is upon us. Um, that's in terms of hobbies. Uh, the other lifelong hobby, uh, which probably some people will find strange, is exactly what I do for a living. I also find that to be my favorite hobby, playing the cello, learning about music, um, and of course, playing with chamber music with others. And by chamber music, I mean any kind of musical interrupt, in, interaction. Um, that's one thing that, that's that been uh, really missed. I, I know I can speak for myself, but also for most of my colleagues, that's what we've been missing on, not being able to interact on stage and otherwise. Um, otherwise, I can tell that my portion of quarantine has not been horrible. Uh, first of all, I stayed healthy, which is, which has helped me matter. Uh, but also, in some strange way, it gave me time to practice, get back to the basics about uh, playing the instrument, um, learning some other repertoire, uh, but mostly just spending time one-on-one -on -one with the instrument, not feeling the pressure of upcoming concerts or well, the usual time crunch. Mm -hmm. Good. That's great. So you're doing well. Doing very well. Yeah. So in general, what makes a great cello? I mean, what, you know, why are these fine historic instruments in general superior? Uh, so this is just my opinion because, uh, uh there is still a debate as to whether they're superior or not. But let's just say that these are the pieces of ours that could not be reproduced. You know, most of the instruments, not just cellos, but violins, uh, the great ones were made in a fairly short period of time of about a hundred years, maybe between 1650 or 1680, let's say, six, let's say 1650 to just uh, middle or upper 1700s. And they were mostly made in a fairly small area, geographical area in Italy, between really between two cities, uh, Venice and Cremona. Um, and what makes them superior is that, uh, in my opinion, first of all, the craftsmanship was amazing. 
the materials they used were uh, proven with time, um, which is wood that was uh, naturally aged and dried. And also, of course, we have the luxury of uh, those instruments being around for over 300 years. So the ones that have actually kept up with the demand developed over 300 years. And so we know that they're, they're working great. Um, there are modern instruments being made and actually every year for the past 300 years, there were modern instruments that have been made uh, just like modern music that was being written. Um, and probably nowadays, uh, more than any time, the makers, the luthiers, we call them, are probably just as skillful, if not more skillful than before. It just, we don't have the 300 year uh, of experience of that instrument aging to know what it's going to be like. Uh, but if we talk specifically about cellos, um, and again, that's just my opinion, uh, between the two city, cities, the Cremona and the Venice, there are a school of thinking that the Cremonese instruments are superior and then some think that Venetian instruments were superior. And it's really, as we say, you know, you cannot argue about taste. But uh, there is something to be said about Venetian instruments um, were made just between 1680 and 1740 by really two amazing makers one's name was Matteo Gofriller which does not sound at all like an Italian name because he wasn't he was a German that came from Tyrol uh, and came down to Venice and the other one's name was Domenico Montagnana who was Italian the last name just says that he came from the mountains and those are the two makers that probably made the most amazing concert instruments that are still being played at this time. So what's the primary instrument that you play? Talk about your, your instrument. My primary instrument is uh, the instrument that I'm playing courtesy of the orchestra. For the past two years, it was made by Domenica Montagnana in 1730. And it really is a, uh, an honor and a privilege to to really be able to um, make music on something like that because um, I'm sure it has seen so much, so many events in history. I mean, just imagine it's almost 300 years old. Yeah. Um, the known history of it is quite interesting actually because we only know of just about six owners hmm. and it goes back to the late 1700s uh, and what is interesting is that every owner pretty much hang on, hung on to that instrument for a long time so there was something that kept them fascinated with it hmm. and i'll just tell you briefly that the first owner that we know of um, came from venice and then moved to cologne germany and it was a family that um were very heavily involved in making perfume. So much so that when they moved to Germany, they called their perfume Eau de Cologne. And it is still being produced and is still being sold, which is quite amazing. Um, and the last owner, previous to uh, my usage, was a principal cellist of Minnesota Orchestra who's had it for about 30 years. So it's, uh, the history is documented and it really is sublime. There was a cellist, a uh, British cellist, last name her, her name was Muckle. And she was a, a very famous concert cellist in uh, England. Um, that was probably one of the most famous ones before Jacqueline Dupre. There were maybe two, uh, Beatrice Harrison uh, and Emerald Fleming, 
And so this, uh, this lady who played on the solo for 70 years, and there's still postcards from the early 1900s picturing oh. her with that particular instrument. Wow. So what are the qualities that you love about this instrument? I mean, you know, when you go about choosing an instrument like this, it's going to be your partner. And, and what are the things that you find, what, what made this stand out for you? You know, of course, we, we say we cannot judge by appearances because an instrument could look a certain way and sound completely different. But there was something about this cello when I saw it, this particular dark reddish hue of the varnish that literally corresponded to the red dark sound that it produced. It was very rich sounding instrument that uh, projected a lot, had a very bassy throaty sound. And what was interesting to me is this really the first time that I've encountered that an instrument, it sort of did not offer anything on its own. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, it just sounded. It just sounded, it would do everything that you would do. So whatever ideas, um, fantasies, images, um, I, I would have in my mind and try to reproduce it, it would do, but not just simply uh, sound that way. It would increase every one of them tenfold. Yeah. And over, it truly overwhelmed me uh, with the amount of freedom that I felt it would give me to, 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 to really try to find every kind of color and expression. Mm -hmm. And the reason I said about this particular quality of offering something is because uh, I've tried other many, many instruments, uh, including uh, uh, Stradivarius, which is a Cremonese instrument and, of course, probably the most known name in music. Um, and that cello just had a way of sounding and it offered the way to make a phrase, it offered a certain color, and it was magnificent. But it wouldn't want to do anything else. So it was kind of, it uh, guided me to a certain way of playing uh, which at the time was remarkable and uh, fascinating. But I found that a little bit stifling uh, in a way that when I tried this Montagnana and I started trying this and that and this and that, it just kind of said, go ahead, you know, just try whatever you'd like. Um, harder, stronger, more beautiful, more ugly, any kind of expression. And it did it. So... Mm -hmm. That was quite interesting. Have you played other Montagnana cellos? I did indeed. Um, probably another five or six different instruments, but uh, probably the most memorable was uh, uh, Montagnana that was made in 1720, and it used to belong to uh, cellist Lynn Harrell, who just passed earlier this year. He was a marvelous American cellist who at the time uh, was thinking of selling it. And he kind of knew that I had a concerto appearances uh, coming up with the Cincinnati Symphony. I played the Schumann concerto. And he said, well, go ahead, try it and play in it for a while and see if you like it. And, uh, you know, it was thrilling, first of all, because I admire uh, this musician, always have admired him since my early age. Um, and to be able to play that instrument was just truly thrilling. And so I used it for the Schumann concerto. Uh, it was in 2015, yeah, just five years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what other cellos do you own or sometimes play? Uh, my own cello was made in uh, Milan in 1700. It actually is older. Uh, than the Montagnana, it's, I mean, really, it's 320 years old. <laughs> Talking about, you know, cranky old cello. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a beautiful cello, and uh, I use it, and I actually uh, lend it out to Hiromatsu, our uh, fellow cellos in the symphony. So it was 
it gets to be played a lot by a wonderful cellist and it's part of our cello sound in the cello section. Mm -hmm. And I do have uh, another modern instrument by um, David Burgess, who was a, who's a contemporary American maker. Uh, also a fascinating man. He was one of the first Americans to, to win a competition in Cremona that's named, uh, it was first named after Stradivarius, but then it was just called Cremona uh, String Instrument Competition. He won it, then he entered again and won it again, entered again and won it again, and they said to him, no, it's enough. Uh, <laughs> why don't you be the judge of the competition? So since really, since uh, the early 80s, he's been on the jury of that particular competition, and uh, his instrument is on display on a permanent collection in Cremona. They have this uh, phenomenal uh, museum of instruments, which I was, I, I visited a couple of years ago, and it was very much fun to see his instrument there. Um, fabulous craftsmanship, and uh, the cello sounded wonderful, so I thought that it is absolutely something that I, I should have and play. Wow. So how do these two other instruments, the the older, the 1700 Milan cello and this, this modern instrument, how do they compare to the Montagnana? They all have uh, wonderful qualities, just like people, you know, every everyone is slightly different. Um, I think the, the older one, the Grancino, has kind of like a um, very aristocratic, old world sound. Uh, it's beautiful. It's, it's warm. Um, and the modern instrument was just made in 2014. So it's only six years old and it still has time to develop, but it's, uh, it has a very clean kind of sound and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing about Montagnana that is truly apparent to me was that it had such an amazing presence. Uh, that it was impossible not to notice. That instrument has uh, a character while being able to mix into with other sounds, it can uh, stand out in such a way that it is truly amazing. And it's actually why a lot of cellists who've come through as soloist playing with Cincinnati Symphony just on the stage of musical use them and just to uh, use that particular maker. And just to name a few, Yo-Yo Ma uh, has played a Montagnana cello and was graciously gracious enough to give me the instrument to try just on the stage. Um, the most recent was Alisa Wallerstein, uh, Truls Mork. All of them have a Montagnana cello and everybody could attest that it has an incredible presence. You know, uh, the relationship between instruments and people is is, a, is of some kind of a miracle. You know, uh, mm -hmm. players really do um, change with an instrument that they play. So some instruments are more shy, some are more extroverted, and therefore the personality of a player changes a lot as well. Um, what is amazing is that music whole here in Cincinnati is one of probably the most amazing venues to play, especially after it's been renovated. It just sounds so fantastic and we cannot wait to get there and play for people, not just doing uh, recordings and live broadcasts, but actually to play for people because there's nothing like hearing live music inside music hall with Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Well, I've been speaking via Zoom with Ilya Finkelstein, principal cellist of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Thank you so much for making time to chat. Thank you for having me.